thousands of kilometers of artificial waterways, hundreds of exceptional engineering structures, revolutionary inventions, and titanic building sites. Since the 17th century, canals are among the greatest achievements of civil engineering. It was an enormous effort in an era when they had no machines. Three legendary canals will revolutionize the French landscape. The Canal de Midi, whose construction begun in 1667, makes it an absolute masterpiece. In the northeast of France, there is the Grand Canal of Alsace, equipped with the latest technology to produce electricity by diverting the Rhine. In the center of France, on the lateral canal of the Loire, it was necessary to innovate and to invent new patents to create structures that are unique in the world. Thanks to feats like these, the Canal de Midi, the Canal of Alsace, and the Loire Canal succeeded in achieving the impossible. All three are record holders and gigantic feats of engineering. Canals are among the oldest grand scale human achievements. Before the arrival of railways, canals were the solution for transporting large volumes of goods. Water traffic allows a horse to pull 60 times its weight. That's considerable. A canal also irrigates the agricultural fields it passes through. By creating loopholes, the water can spread over numerous plots of land. Canals have many advantages. In 1605, the Briere Canal in the center of France was the first with a length of 50 kilometers. Yet over the next 300 years, canals were to multiply and become larger and larger. Among all the achievements, there is one that is known the world over. A stunning technical feat in the 17th century, as well as a work of art. The Canal de Midi. It was the largest construction site in France, apart from Versailles. Built between 1667 and 1682, with a record number of engineering structures along the route, there are more than 500 listed on 240 kilometers of waterway. The Canal de Midi is a megastructure, linking the port of Sète in the south of France to the city of Toulouse in the west. And it would also link up with the Garonne Canal, which ends in Bordeaux. This monumental work would allow goods to be transported across France. It's a brainchild of a true genius, Pierre-Paul Riquet. He called himself the Moses of Languedoc, and he proved that he could master the waters. Before building the Canal de Midi, Riquet is far from being a recognized engineer. His schooling had been somewhat mediocre, but he addresses the objective with a determination second to none. He works day and night to draw the outlines of an exceptional megastructure for the time. It's as if someone was going to propose to the European Commission to build a canal 600 kilometers long, at his own expense, risk and peril. All this while having no specific knowledge of the field. We often read about Riquet the engineer. Actually, he was nothing of the kind. However, the letter he writes to King Louis XIV with a view to building the Canal de Midi is well received. This canal would further enhance the splendor of Louis XIV. He would become the first king to achieve the impossible. Yet first, Riquet must find an answer to a simple yet vital question. How to fill the future canal with water? Those who had envisaged the canal before Riquet had thought of using the water of the Pyrenees. 
Bringing water from the summits would require gigantic pipes following the terrain. It would cost a fortune. Yet, there's an even bigger problem. A mountain blocking the route between Set and Toulouse. Nobody had solved the fundamental problem, the crossing of the Nuhu's threshold, 189 meters high. The Nuhu's is an insurmountable obstacle. Yet, it's imperative that the water pass through this stage, and gravity prevents water from going up. Riquet is considering another solution. He went to look for it where nobody had looked for it before, in the Black Mountains. They're called the Water Tower of the South of France since they're midway between the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean. The Black Mountains are part of the Massif Central and rise to an altitude of 1,211 meters. It's the point where Atlantic and Mediterranean winds meet each other, causing massive downpours. They're huge, 1,400 millimeters of water per year. That's 1.4 meters of water height. Riquet plans to recover the water from the Black Mountains by digging a canal to the Nauru's threshold. From there, it will serve the Canal de Midi towards Toulouse on one side and towards Set on the other. But the entrepreneur has yet another idea. He wants to store water from the Black Mountains to send it to his canal in times of drought. He embarks on a colossal project, the construction of a huge water reservoir the dam of saint Ferriol. It's the first reservoir dam of this size in the whole of Europe. Riquet has no other choice but to build a giant of a dam. It will regulate the water supply to the canal. While there will be enough water in winter, a reserve will be paramount to prevent the canal from running dry in summer. The location of saint Ferriol seems ideal for collecting rainwater. It's a natural basin. Yet, it will be necessary to block a lake covering more than 60 hectares. It will be the biggest dam ever built in Europe. Yet how to achieve this feat in 1660? Riquet didn't have any references for building a dam on that scale. This did not prevent him from launching the construction work, which lasted five years, from 1667 to 1672. A thousand workers tear up the earth on one side and pile up millions of cubic meters of fill on the other to form a wall 149 meters wide. It's adjoined by a wall of stones and bricks. It's 871 meters long. That's almost three Eiffel Towers laid down in a row. It allows the phenomenal thrust of the lake to be held back as it gradually forms. A gallery is dug in the heart of the rampart. It holds the valves that open the trapdoors in the dam. Three taps are used to let out the water contained behind the wall. Each one delivers 600 litres per second. Thus, large quantities of water flow into a 38 kilometre long canal. At the end of the route, the Nauru's threshold. Anticipating his success on the Black Mountains, Riquet simultaneously starts work on the canal. To carry out the exceptional project, Louis XIV offered him free labor. The king had authorized Riquet to take people on corvée, that's to say, to force them to work for free. However, Riquet made no use of the offer, which is extraordinary. He could have saved a lot of money that way, but didn't. The entrepreneur has a very different approach with his workers. He wants to instill a team spirit for this extraordinary achievement and offers them exceptional conditions for the time. 
Sundays off were paid, there was no work on holidays, and there was what we would call sick leave, which was also paid. Riquet recruits 12,000 workers, and remarkably, one third of them are women. Their job is to remove the soil. It's organized a bit like an army. There are four sections, each with its own supervisor, and it all works very well. Riquet's organization may be impeccable, but it's going to run into a lot of problems. There's 249 kilometers of route to lay out, to dig, to drill, and it holds some nasty surprises for the builders. One of the passages that requires the most inventive thinking is here, where the canal route is cut by a small river, the Repudra. It's a point that could jeopardize the entire enterprise. Riquet was extremely worried about flooding that could seriously damage the canal. It's a problem that gives the builder cold sweats. How do you avoid a stream that may cut through your path and overflow the canal? Riquet really has no other choice than to create the first canal bridge in France. In 1676, the project is considered absurd. A canal on a bridge? Imagining this type of structure makes Riquet look like a genius, but also a bit mad. No one had ever seen the light before. By calculating the exact slope for the water to flow, the workers start to build a bridge over the Rapudra. But it's not just any bridge. The floods of the river could erode the pillars, not to mention the thousands of litres of water that have to be contained above. You need extraordinarily tough structures to bear the weight of the water over time and to avoid seepage inside, which could cause the whole thing to explode under pressure. A structure that opposes the flow of large floods, a mass of water to be contained. For Riquet's contemporaries, this is unthinkable. And yet, there are precedents for a challenge like this. The Romans had come up with the answer 1,600 years before. Abundant volcanic ash in the Bay of Naples made it possible to obtain the hardest concrete in the world. Riquet has found his solution. If you add porcelanic ash, it allows you to fill extremely fine holes in the cement, and that transforms it into a concrete of exceptional hardness. Riquet thus obtains a virtually indestructible structure, as proven during the disastrous flood of 1843. Back then, the water rose to more than seven meters, well above the bridge, which remained unscathed. Riquet's bridge is more than a success. It is a world first. It's slightly sloping, like the entire canal, ensuring that the water will keep moving along the 250 kilometers of the canal requires constant checking and dredging at the bottom. What's more, sometimes the ground level can drop sharply over dozens of meters. Like in the Bézier region, about 40 kilometers from the Repudre Bridge. The terrain suddenly drops, and the builders see a new problem arising. It needs the creation of an exceptional device, which still works perfectly today. The locks, the equivalent of lifts for boats. It's a world record again. In Fonsoran, there are eight consecutive locks. They are essential. When the slope of the canal is too steep, it becomes impossible to tow a boat. The system of a lock is based on these big doors that open and close. When the boat has to go up the canal, it goes into a lock chamber. The back door closes. The boat lies still. Then water from the upper level is allowed to flow into the boat lock. The water level rises 
and so does the boat. When the boat reaches the upper level, the front door opens and the boat can continue its journey. Boats can then go down or up the stairs of Fonseran. The 30 meters of difference in height is made up by the eight locks which follow one another. And by designing ovoid lock chambers, Riquet plans to fit not just one, but several boats into the lift to save time. Another special feature, the locks are not closed by conventional gates, which would be unbolted by the water pressure. They are triangular in shape, thus offering better penetration into the liquid mass. A solution both remarkably functional and aesthetic. Yet, there are many twists and turns during the construction of the canal. Like the Molpa Hill, its steep rise prohibits any idea of constructing locks on its slope. The hill is an obstacle that may spell the end for the entire project. Jean-Baptiste Colbert, Louis XIV's minister, sends a delegation of engineers to report on the extent of the problem. Among them, a good few who have never looked favorably on Riquet's work and who relish the idea of stopping the Canal de Midi project for good. But Riquet doesn't even consider giving up. Instead, he stages a hoax. To get rid of the observers, he makes them believe that he agrees with their verdict. He pretends he's stopping work and will pay off his teams. He just keeps a handful of men to dig a human-sized tunnel. It can only be crossed by stooping while holding a torch. It was paramount to force a passage to prove that this obstacle could be overcome. Riquet discovers that the rock at the bottom of the hill is so-called tough. As it's quite crumbly, you can dig rather easily. There are fears that everything may collapse, yet the tunnel holds. It's another feat never seen before anywhere in the world, a canal which pierces a hill. After facing dozens of obstacles, the work finally nears completion. It's an unheard of performance on a stretch of almost 250 kilometers. The Canal de Midi is inaugurated in 1681, 15 years after the first ground was broken at the Black Mountains. One man was missing at the ceremony. Exhausted and almost broke, Riquet dies at the age of 71, seven months before the opening of the canal. Today, more than 70,000 users follow the impressive route of the Canal de Midi each year. Modest boats and barges, a far cry from the multi-ton giants of steel underway further north in France. On the amazing Grand Canal of Alsace. It's a true megastructure dug parallel to the Rhine. 50 kilometers long, with monumental locks Monsters of concrete among the largest in Europe. They lift 9,000 ton boats some 20 meters high, the equivalent of a six story building. Six hundred ton gates are holding back millions of liters of water. Yet the canal hides other records a little bit further on four power plants and their giant turbines. The turbine is more than three meters in diameter, more than 10 meters high. So we are really into gigantic sizes. To activate these enormous turbines, engineers have envisaged an underwater maze of exceptional structures and elements weighing several hundred tons, assembled to the 10th of a millimeter.
It's an impressive achievement, and we still wonder sometimes how they managed to build such structures back then. The construction of the Grand Canal of Alsace goes back almost a century. Work begins in 1928. The primary objective of the new canal is to regulate the Rhine, the great river along France's eastern border, known to be uncontrollable. Glaciers in the Swiss Alps, high mountain lakes and heavy rainfall are the driving force behind spectacular floods. A canal is intended to reduce the risk of inundations on the riverbanks. To achieve this, the planners decide to split the Rhine in two, so that part of the flow will be continued by the river and part will be diverted into a canal. The solution they come up with, an enormous dam. To keep it from being swept away by the onrushing water, the engineers opt for an unusual design. There are five openings for the water to pass through. Each of them has an upper gate weighing 120 tons, as well as a lower gate weighing almost 70 tons. The concrete piers are 15 meters wide, resulting in a barrage 170 meters long. Only a behemoth of this size can stand up to the Rhine's most violent floods. Yet the dam also allows the water to be directed towards one of the most incredible sites of the time, a massive structure that will use the power of the waters of the Grand Canal of Alsace. The Kems hydroelectric power station on the Grand Canal of Alsace is one of the most effective electricity plants in France. Due to its power stations, the canal produces 10% of the country's hydroelectricity. The man behind the idea of using a canal to produce electricity is René Kochlin. The engineer who studied in Strasbourg conceived the installation of four power stations on the Grand Canal of Alsace. Thanks to an outlet from the canal, the water will rush and fall into a pipe. Then arrive at high speed in a room where propellers will start the rotation of a wheel of more than four meters in diameter. To activate the blades of the wheel, the water has to reach a certain speed. To that end, pipes are dug that bring the water to a depth of 14 meters. They are colossal in size. Each pipe is more than 15 meters in diameter. The pipes are sized to carry millions of liters, which will flow inside for several decades. Yet, before it reaches the wheel, the water can be accelerated or slowed down on demand. Large flaps, controlled by the plant's control room, allow the blades to be tilted. Depending on whether they obstruct the water or whether they are set in profile for the lowest possible impact, thousands of liters that arrive every second hit the wheel with the intended degree of power. Once the water comes rushing on, the wheel must perform flawlessly so that there are no adverse reactions. The slightest deformation of the blades can cause increasingly strong vibrations in the wheel, finally destroying the structures and the entire electric compartment. At high speeds, the mass of the turbine becomes so significant that the slightest imperfection can be fatal. When fully assembled, the wheel weighs 140 tons, which is the equivalent of more than 100 cars. As the wheels turn at up to 90 revolutions per minute, they require close observation. Replacing them is an operation costing several million euros. If a fault occurs, the water access valve in the turbine must be closed and the room must be drained. Only then is it possible to dismantle the assembly above. A change of the turbine is planned for every 60 years. It's an unavoidable operation, as water will erode the metal. 
When there is no other choice but to change the wheel, an exceptional device is put in place, like here in another plant at Fessenheim, a few hundred meters from the Kemp site. It's an historic moment, the arrival of a brand new wheel. To steer and turn it around, the teams use an immense overhead crane that can lift 150 tons of steel, with ties made to match the weight. We use textile slings with a capacity of 70 tons each. A 10 ton support has even been specially designed to be able to operate inside the wheel to assemble the parts. It also allows all welds to be checked inside as well as outside. A few millimeters too much and the whole turbine can come apart during rotation. With such a huge mass in motion, the machining has to be perfect so that the water will run smoothly at all points. The welds in particular must be completely watertight. Any wheel change requires several weeks of expert handling. More than 600 tons must be disassembled. The single parts are enormous in size, like this nut. It weighs a ton. The nut is the link between the wheel and the other main part of the installation, the alternator. An alternator has two parts, a mobile part, which is the rotor, and a fixed part called the stator. When assembled, these two parts weigh over 100 tons. Between them, powerful magnets play their part in the creation of electricity. The cost for a construction site amounts to 10 million euros, and that's for a single power unit. There are six of them at the CHEMS power station alone. Combined with the three other power stations on the canal, the power released is colossal. The Grand Canal of Alsace provides an output of four terawatt. Enough power to supply a major portion of France. It's an incredible performance for a 50 kilometer canal. Yet energy production isn't the only asset of the Grand Canal of Alsace. A few hundred meters from the plant is yet another megastructure, the locks of the canal. 190 meters long, the equivalent of three airliners placed end to end. 25 meters wide and with a depth to accommodate a 10-story building. A monster of concrete, capable of handling the world's largest inland vessels, built in a time frame never seen before in the 1930s. A mere four years to build all these facilities, the power station, the locks, the dam, it was a record. The locks of the Grand Canal of Alsace are among the largest projects of civil engineering in the 20th century. The challenges are immense. The mere dimensions pose a problem. How can the huge locks be filled and emptied quickly? To handle as many boats as possible in a day. And what if the water comes in too fast and uncontrolled? You have a swell which is much stronger on one side than on the other. Even if a boat is running its engines and tries to stay in place, the force of the water is so strong that the boat will be pushed to the other side. To contain the massive influx of water, the engineers designed structures of a size never seen in the region. To allow for work in proper conditions, the gates of the dam are shut well before the actual construction of the future locks. The ground is thus completely dry when work on the two concrete megaboxes begins. They will operate alternately, depending on maintenance or technical problems that may arise. 
The twin behemoths work the same way. With each one, there is a door upstream as well as downstream to close the lock. The gates themselves are exceptional. They must support the pressure of the Grand Canal's water mass at the front and at the back. So they are sized accordingly. 18 meters high, 26 meters wide, fixed with 20,000 bolts, they weigh in excess of 600 tons. This much mass is necessary to ensure that the lock can be safely filled. Yet, how do you lift these monsters several times a day? It's possible thanks to the loads. They act as counterweights on both sides of the gate with a combined weight of 400 tons. Thus, the load to be lifted is reduced to 200 tons. And with 60 horsepower engines, their performance is assured on a daily basis. At the Grand Canal, the water inlets are not placed inside the gates as with conventional locks, since here, the water pressure is such that it's impossible to open a hatch. So how do you fill the lock with tens of thousands of liters of water in 20 minutes without openings in the doors? Engineers and architects must find another solution. They opt for a valve in the future bed of the Grand Canal. The water will flow through two separate tubes along the 190 meters of the lock. Openings all along the walls will then let the water in. The valves will open in stages, so the water does not arrive all at once. Via the aqueducts, it is distributed slowly, so we don't have a sudden onrush of water. Up in his control room, the lock keeper supervises the opening of the hatches. Yet the large amount of water that arrives in a matter of seconds means the boats have to be tied down to avoid being tossed around in the lock. Floating bollards in the side walls help keep the boat in position while progressing vertically. They hold the boat in place, so the sailor just has to make sure his mooring is secure. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, the Grand Canal of Alsace sees boats from 3,500 tons to monsters carrying more than 12,000 tons of goods, the equivalent of 600 trucks. River transport thus emits four times less CO2 than road transport. By reducing the risk of major floods of the Rhine, while producing clean electrical energy by harnessing the force of water, and by reducing the carbon footprint of goods transport, the Grand Canal of Alsace has proved a masterpiece of civil engineering. Just like a century ago, one of the most stunning canals of its time beats all records. The lateral canal of the Loire River. Among its main features, a canal bridge designed in part by the most famous engineer of the 19th century, Gustave Eiffel. It's the longest all-metal canal bridge in Europe. Inside its substructions, an ingenious valve system allows the canal to be emptied to avoid the water freezing and destroying the bridge in winter. From outside, you can't imagine what's underground. Back then, the cream of engineers is summoned to solve a technical problem. How do you build a bridge strong enough to withstand the pressure of the devastating floods of the Loire River? They're colossal. The volume of water that passed through was enormous. With water levels that can rise to seven meters, the Loire is notorious for being particularly dangerous. The river defies navigation, so the powers that be decide to construct an altogether new waterway with a view to reaching Paris and sending goods there. 
Originally, it had been envisaged to tame the Loire by using a system of dams all along the river. Alas, that would have been very expensive and taken a long time to accomplish. Above all, there'd still be the problem of destruction, as the river will eat away the heaped up earth before the dams are finished, so they would have to be renewed continually and even made bigger. At the beginning of the 19th century, the decision is taken to build a secure canal. It will extend over 196 kilometers from the city of Digoin to Briar, where another canal will take over to reach Paris. It's a long haul, especially with the means available at the time. All the work is done by hand, with shovel, pickaxe and wheelbarrow. It will take 16 years to build the canal. That's more than 10 kilometers per year. To go even faster, work is split up into two parts. The upstream section is the responsibility of Jean-Joseph Vigoureux. The downstream part is the brief of Marie-Noël Lejeune. Each of the two engineers is managing his site as he sees fit. The first difficulty to overcome is here. At Digoin, the route of the canal requires crossing the Loire. So to get boats across the river, a canal bridge must be built. It will become one of the largest in France, 243 meters long. The problem, its dimensions make it susceptible to the uncontrollable behavior of the river. How could they build anything that will not be washed away by floods? The challenge is to build a structure that would allow up to six meters of water to pass through. So during summer, when the river runs lowest, piers are erected, able to withstand anything the river can carry. They're shaped like a boat's prow and intended to break the current. For the first time, impact studies are conducted by specialists. They prove their worth in 1846 with the largest flood ever recorded on the Loire. The floods of 1846 and 1856 not only devastated the landscape, they also claimed numerous victims. The flood is almost seven meters high and it's coming over the bridge with a bang. Several thousand liters per second rush through the 11 arches. The water built up an enormous pressure. The piers are anchored three meters below the low water mark. Yet, it's uncertain whether the bridge will be able to withstand such a violent force. The engineers' knees were shaking. They thought, if this one goes well, the bridge will always hold. But there's no guarantee. You just had to have faith. Yet, the bridge is holding. The success of the design is undeniable. The Diguan Canal Bridge is the first great feat of the canal. But it's far from being the only structure to raise concern. At the end of the Loire Canal, crossing the river seems impossible. Here, a canal bridge would require a river crossing of 660 meters to join the Briard Canal to Paris. However, the technical means of the 19th century do not allow the building of such a long bridge able to resist severe floods. With a stone-built arch bridge, there can be no more than 11 meters between each pile. All the water coming on would have had to pass through these 11 meters. The stonework would have been washed away. That's why in 1836, they abandoned the idea of constructing this kind of bridge. It's a real problem, because when boats arrive here at the Mantelo Passage, they enter the Loire proper. They must take great risks to get across to the other bank to reach the Briard Canal. The currents of the river are relentless when it comes to ship handling. 
It was extremely perilous, requiring extraordinary know-how in navigation and anchoring. As the years go by, the crossing is causing more and more problems. Some boats drift, precious goods are lost. Sometimes traffic jams of several hundred meters are created along the canal. Engineers are desperately looking for a solution and a technology to build a canal bridge. They had to wait until 1880, when technological evolution allowed the use of other materials. Léon Sabel Mazoyer, one of the engineers responsible for the revolution in processing metal, developed mild steel, a mixture of iron and a small percentage of carbon. It's a principle still used today. The advantage of this material is that you get something which is highly resistant to bending. It's finally possible to do away with the round arches, as used on the De Guan Canal Bridge, by spacing the piers much more widely using metal spans 40 meters long. The result is unlike anything done before, including the aesthetic aspect. The Briar Canal Bridge is made up of thousands of clearly visible bolts, relying on riveting. A process that glues two metal plates together. It's done by heating up a bolt in a mobile forge on site. It's as small as a portable barbecue. The bolt is brought to incandescence and put through both metal plates. Then it's flattened at the end into a rounded shape. When it cools down, the metal expands and consequently locks the plates. Thousands of bolts are present on the bridge canal. They are the trademark of the most famous engineer of all time. On the Garabie viaduct, as well as on the stunning new tower in Paris, Rivets are the signature of Gustave Eiffel. Yet, it's not for his expertise in steel that he is called upon. Eiffel was originally a mason, so he only built the piers on the canal bridge. It proves quite a challenge for the engineer, as a nasty surprise awaits the workers. How are they going to erect huge piers on totally unstable ground? If you want to build a bridge on sandy ground, the piers will start to move, so the bridge tends to collapse. Eiffel is called in because of his worldwide experience with this type of problem. The solution he comes up with is most effective. He proposes installing a watertight caisson on the riverbed. Once down there, the workers will drive the foundation several meters deep into the hard ground, working under oxygen. You can do this at home with a simple mustard jar. Plunge it into a basin full of water so that air will be trapped inside. That's the air the workers breathe, except that after a while it's used up, so you have to inject new air. The piers vary in height from 5.4 meters to 9.92 meters, depending on the soil below. More than 100,000 cubic meters of concrete are poured. With their protruding shape, the piers are also designed to divert tree trunks carried along during major floods. The canal bridge, with its piers spaced to allow a maximum of water to pass and its stable foundations, appears to be the perfect solution. Alas, there's a threat to any metal structure. With the onset of winter, there'll be sub-zero temperatures. When water freezes, it takes on a greater volume and may thus cause the rivets on the bridge to blow. The entire structure could be in danger right from the start and interrupt the canal. Mazoyer is obliged to find a solution before disaster strikes. To avoid it, he decides to turn the canal bridge into a kind of gigantic empty swimming pool. 
The engineers of the time planned devices, which we call guard doors, to close the canal bridge at each end. They were intended to shut off the water from both sides. As soon as there are three consecutive nights with temperatures of minus 10 degrees Celsius, we empty the canal bridge. Eight openings along the bridge allow it to be drained. When we open these valves, the water flows into the pier and then into the Loire, without anyone seeing it happening. This way, within two hours, the canal bridge is emptied. The risk of the water freezing and deforming the bridge is removed. Once the freezing period is over, we open small windows in the guard doors so that we can refill the canal. Once that's done, we reopen the gates and navigation resumes. When filled, the Briar Canal Bridge is a colossus among the engineering works of the 19th century. It took six years to complete, is 660 meters long, and including water, has an overall weight of more than 13,000 tons, holding the world record for the longest metal bridge for more than a century. It is the absolute masterpiece of the Loire Canal. At least, it's the most visible one. Since only a few dozen meters away, there is another exceptional building. Inside is a unique installation designed to collect water from the Loire and deliver it over miles to the Briar Canal, the waterway that takes over from the Loire Canal. This building is so huge to accommodate the machinery needed to perform this task. The power plant runs on coal. Every three days, 250 tons are unloaded at the site. An impressive amount of fuel to drive giant pumps, which lift water directly from the Loire. They built the plant in the immediate vicinity of the Loire and connected the subsoil of the plant to the river via a gallery. The tube is 340 meters long and runs 10 meters below the surface. Five pumps and wheels with a diameter of 10 meters and a weight of seven tons each collect the water from the Loire. With the aid of steam power, the balancers will gradually push the water. Hundreds of liters are thus pumped into another conduit. It transports the water over two kilometers. Once it reaches a high point, it goes down a channel that gradually descends for 11 kilometers. It then feeds the Briar Canal, which will take over from the Loire Canal and provide the link with Paris. Without this plant, it would not be possible to reach the French capital. It's really the high point of engineering genius of the time and allowed the realization of the entire project. The bridge over the Loire Canal and the power station are extraordinary challenges met brilliantly by the engineers. Just like another challenge 100 kilometers to the south, it's a unique structure in terms of its design. The Guetin Bridge allows boats on the Loire Canal to cross the Allier. The river with a particularly shifting sandy bed, which makes the construction of piers at this point extremely difficult. In 1834, Pierre Vigoureux, an engineer of the Bridges and Roads Department, proposes to solve the problem of this inconstant soil with a spectacular technique. Instead of single rectangles on which the piers are placed, he's going to make a huge continuous space, which will cross the river from one bank to the other. This base, with its weight of several hundred tons, ensures perfect stability for the piers of the canal bridge. 
18 arches, each 16 meters wide, will provide a giant basin for boats. However, there is a problem no one yet knows how to deal with. How do you put concrete on the ground while the river flows, and where, even in times of drought, there's always some water which prevents work on the site? And this will lead to another innovation in architecture. Quick setting cement. The engineers will resort to porcelain made of volcanic stone. An incredibly strong cement used by the Romans to build the Pantheon in Rome, or the Colosseum 2,000 years ago. They invented an artificial potalan, which made it possible to pour the concrete so that it dries much faster. It's a game changer in construction work. Thanks to the new cement, which takes half the time to dry out, the workers are able to divert the river temporarily onto neighboring plots of land to add section after section of the gigantic base. It's even perceptible today according to the level of the Allier River. Over four years, the site involved 150 workers, but also 250 convicts deployed to lend a hand. Thus, the lateral canal of the Loire is finished in 1838. Building a waterway of 196 kilometers in 16 years was a record. As part of the French network of canals, the lateral canal of the Loire allows people to reach Paris from the Mediterranean. Thousands of freight boats use it every year, until another technical revolution takes place. What kills the canals is the arrival of the railway. The development of a tight network of secondary lines meant that the countryside was now within reach of the cities. Obviously, it's impossible to have a similar network of canals. At the end of the 19th century, commercial traffic on the canals begins to decline. Yet today, the formidable structures and works of engineering that can be found along the Canal de Midi or on the lateral canal of the Loire are a source of awe and admiration and are becoming more and more popular. With the development of river tourism comes a true passion for canals. The Fonserin Locks, the Malpa Tunnel and the Briard Canal Bridge are visited by hundreds of thousands of tourists each year. The hydroelectric power stations of the Grand Canal of Alsace are the subject of massive investments to produce the greenest energy possible. And it doesn't stop there. A new canal between the Paris area and the north of France is being planned. An artificial waterway, 107 kilometers long and 54 meters wide. It will allow the navigation of boats carrying thousands of tons of goods.